Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the director of a cult underground movie classic uh, in the world of sci-fi, and that is Slava Sukerman, who directed the 1982 classic Liquid Sky, a very odd, bizarre film but very entertaining, nevertheless. And I'm going to be having him on the show today to talk about that. Um, he also made a movie about 20 years ago um, called Poor Eliza with Lee Grant, and um, Ben Gazzara narrated it. I want to ask him about that as well. I'm sure it'll be a refreshing change of pace to talk about another movie besides Liquid Sky with him. And it's going to be spectacular. I just can't wait. So yeah, here is my interview with Slava Sukerman. Hey, hey Slava, welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? Okay, okay. thank you, Toby. I'm here, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. With my pleasure. So, going back in time, uh, I know you're from Moscow. Um, did you always gravitate toward film early on in your childhood? Yes, 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 yes. As long as I remember myself. The first time I made something which I thought was film when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. do, do you remember the first movie you ever saw? Hmm? Well, uh, you know, it was the time then. No, no, eight millimeter or video or anything like that existed. So, in, especially in Soviet Union, nothing was possible to make. So, what I was, it was more fantasy than reality. Do you have, do you have um, a list of favorite films you like? Oh, sure, I always had a list of favorite films, and uh, speaking. Speaking about, you know, psychedelic, about Liquid Sky being psychedelic, I always, from early child, uh, loved uh, bright colors, and I had dreams which, for some reason, which I cannot explain, I was calling my, my color dreams, I was calling them American films. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, specific directors that influenced you? You mean it, it depends at what period of my life. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, were you, were you into, like, Stanley Kubrick, Alfred Hitchcock, guys like those? Uh, abs, 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 absolutely. You, the, your, first, your first name is absolutely right. Stanley Kubrick is still one of my favorite directors. Oh, God. Uh, closest, I mean, if speaking about... Uh, way of thinking, the way of seeing the world that Stanley Kubrick is probably closest to me. Yeah, about about every movie he ever made is a masterpiece of, of, of some kind. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the way, uh, not, not, only, not, not only from art point of view, from... Uh, from the sense point of view, from philosophical point of view as well, because he is probably the only director who is uh, consistently, uh, consistently uh, proves re relativity of everything. Doesn't uh, uh, on principle he he doesn't know answers. He always shows that there are no answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just all his movies are just terrific. So, in 1961, you you did a film called "I Believe in Spring." Right. Yeah. What was the genesis behind that film? Well, it's uh, it's, it's just there was a time like that in Russia, very optimistic, uh, uh, crucial time, and. Uh, I felt like that. It's a very it's a short film, but it's a love story. It's a very optimistic love story. Yeah, is that movie long gone now? Yes, it's probably it was the first time that that, that was called amateur. As, as I told, nothing 
uh, really nothing uh, existed in Russia. You you could you could make films if you were out of uh, uh, out of official industry, and it was the first time that some uh, some initiative was. Uh, supported, but it was called Amateur Films, but we, we did it with my friend, being students in, in, in the School for construct, Construction Engineering. And uh, uh, we found an old camera, and it actually 16 millimeter still was impossible in Russia, so it was 35 millimeter camera. And I wrote the script uh, to avoid dialogues. It was like a silent movie, uh, I mean, no dialects, just by plot, no dialects. And that's uh, because we couldn't, we could shoot sync sound. So that, that's how we made it. And then this film won all the prizes and all the amateur festivals. I mean, in Russia, it was even in, uh, was even in national, it was released nationally. Yeah, back in those days, the 35 millimeter cameras were pretty expensive, right? Well, it was old camera which was used during the during the war and then like uh, thrown away. I mean, uh, for, for 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 army, it was used for army documentary. It's not it's not camera. You cannot shoot think, film with this camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it but it was very good made. Like for for the for the for the military action, you could. You could drop this camera from the you know, third floor and then still nothing would happen with it. Yeah. So the, the, you decided that uh, you were going to make uh, documentaries after that? No, I, no, no, I not decided that I want to. Actually, I never, uh, I, I'm still doing documentaries and I have a feeling that I want to make this documentary. But documentary is not my area. I never wanted to be a documentary filmmaker. Actually, the most cases when I made documentaries, they were not classic documentaries. Because, uh, because I've always been interested in showing something which is impossible to show some fantasy, some... Uh, uh, so that I was making science documentaries about abstract sciences like quantum mechanics and things like that. But it was enough for me to know that nobody knows how to show it, then it was interesting to me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I never... Only now, now I got, like, normal human interest to other human beings to shoot you know, to, to get an interview which nobody else can get. I, I like it, but that, I don't think it's really my profession. I think it's more journalist work than, than the filmmaker's work. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> and then you were um, uh, living in Jerusalem uh, in the, uh, what was it, the, the 60s, 70s? Right. From 73 to, 73 to 76, three, three years. Yeah, what what made you move to Jerusalem? Well, when we immigrated, when I immigrated, the uh, beginning of immigration from Russia, you could officially you could live only to to uh, join your relatives, real or not real, in Israel. It was a permission to some Jews to 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 join their relatives. But speaking about me, I. Not everybody really moved to Israel. A lot of people left America right away. But I didn't want to go to Jerusalem. I really wanted to make Jewish films. That was my my interest. Mm -hmm. So it was just in Israel I had great success right away. But I, again, I had great success with a documentary. And I understood strange, strange things that... Uh, Documentary is supposed to be more realistic than fiction film, but in truth it's completely opposite. You can make a documentary about something you don't know at all. Your attitude to that would be interesting. You can go to a country you've never been and make a documentary. It can be a good documentary. But there is no way to make a fiction film about a life you don't know close. You need to really know life in order to make good, good, good fiction film. And uh, in Israel, it was like a completely new life, which I need to learn. And actually, Israel back then, Israel today, are two different countries, mostly because the 
because it was much smaller. I mean, the population in Israel was about 3 million. Now I think it's more than 7 million. It's completely different. From point of view of filmmaker, it's completely different country. A country with 3 million population, you cannot make films. There were a couple of good films back then in Israel, but you, know, you make a film which all the audience in the country which would want to see this film will see it in one day. So film, film needs need, need, need to have audience. And a small country cannot uh, really cannot, cannot have a film industry. But now Israel is, makes good films. And all, but back then it was really, you can see that you cannot make fiction film in this country. And besides, well, I came there from... From, from from Russia, which was behind the Iron Curtain. I really knew nothing about life around the world. Mm -hmm. So it didn't took me a long to realize that if I want to make good films, I need to learn, uh, learn mental, Western mentality, and the best place for that is New York. Yeah, was it, was it, a, was it a culture shock coming from Russia to Jerusalem to New York? Well, it wasn't cultural shock. It was like, I mean, the more cultural shock was coming to Jerusalem because Israel really was very different from Russia. Mm -hmm. And even Jews were not, you know, Israeli Jews didn't look like Moscow Jews. <laughs> so in a sense, in a sense, when me and my wife, when we first came to the United States, first to New York, the feeling was more like coming back to Russia. Uh, first of all, because a big city, I, you know, all my life I grown up in Moscow. I used to live in a big city. I, I need, I, I need a lot of people in the street and all that. And uh, and the second, uh, even Jews, Jews were very much like Russian Jews, not like Israelis. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except they're probably a little bit more aggressive in New York. <laughs> I don't want to talk about aggression. The world is changing very much from my young years. When I was young in Russia, uh, young intellectuals, women and artists, really didn't, uh, never thought about politics. I mean, they knew that government is terrible, but who cared? Nobody knew even who is in government. Our life was completely separated from political life. Yeah. In Israel, it was completely different. In Israel, it, I think it didn't change there because you cannot live in a country like Israel and not participate in politics. It was very shocking. Then I came to New York back when, in 1976, New York was in this sense very close to Moscow. You could leave and not care who's president. Yeah. So what, what politicians do was completely out of our interest. And, and I liked it very much. Well, now, good or bad, but America changed. And, uh, it's the world politi 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 I don't know, politicized very much. Yeah. I, I, I cannot say that I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how does Liquid Sky come into the picture? Well, Liquid Sky, uh, you see, I had several, uh, I, I had several projects before, and uh, none of them worked uh, right before Liquid. I mean, I really had this, I, I really had this idea. One of the reasons why I went not to Los Angeles but to New York was that I realized, actually, I didn't know one case that somebody who would come would come to America from from non English speaking country would would make the first film in Hollywood. I realized that only independent film. What what I should do is independent film, and because of the entire history of my life, I knew very well how to make films very cheap, and I thought that that's uh, that's good. And I decided that when I met in New York, I would learn life, and I would try. To project after project, and finally I managed to write something which which will match the right investor, which will be cheap enough and right enough for for right investor. And it's happened exactly this way. So I had several projects uh, before Liquid Sky, which did 
didn't work for many years, I didn't work. And finally, I had one which was a science fiction fantasy, science fiction rock and roll fantasy. And I had, I, we had an investor who wanted to invest, uh, Italian businessman. And uh, uh, he had one condition that it should be not, 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 not that the budget should be not more than half a billion. And he gave money for development, and it started casting. And then it started casting. He found a very good production manager, a person who's supposed to be the best production manager in New York. Mm-hmm. He gave him to read my scripts. Like I read my script and said that there is no way that the script can be done for half a billion. Uh, well, uh, he probably was right, but I would, if you know, if he would stop financing, I would do the film. So uh, he didn't know how to do it. I knew how to do it. But meanwhile, uh, our casting director was Bob Brady, who is a liquid guy playing the, playing the uh, himself, acting, acting teacher who was acting teacher. And, and we were casting, and he had his classes and his loft. And during the casting, we became friends. My wife and I became friends with his, with him and his students. Among them, and Carlisle was the most noticeable. So, so I, I realized that I need to write a script which said we can be done for half a million. And then the idea of Liquid Sky came to my mind. Yeah. And, and one of parts of this idea was that I'm not going to cast names, that I'm going to write script for people whom I know, which which obviously in, in many cases is the best way to make good film, because people who make low-budget films don't understand it. They don't understand that if they write some complicated characters, they cannot cast. Uh, that because the actors who can play these roles are already stars, they cannot reach the stars. So, for certain, so they compromise with they compromise with cast and compromise with cast. That's the way to lose. You cannot make a good film if you compromise with the cast. So the best way is to to write uh, uh, write scripts knowing who is going to play this character. Yeah, I mean. That, that, Yeah, because when I watch the movie, you know, I see such an influence of, of Kubrick and Andy Warhol in terms of bizarreness and visuals and those vibrant colors. The movie really symbolizes that European-esque punk rock scene that was going on in New York. Uh, did you spend a lot of time going to, like, the clubs like CBGB and all of those? Yes, well, okay, so you, you first you mentioned Andy Warhol, which was absolutely it was another re- reason. I loved Andy Warhol tremendously at that moment of my life. Actually, the project which didn't happen before that, mm-hmm. which I was telling, which we were casting, had a role for Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol agreed to play there. I would, if you feel good the time, I would have Andy Warhol as an actor in my film. So, uh, so, and I always thought that uh, as a filmmaker, Andy Warhol went like a light way, like too artistic, but his paintings are more commercial. And, and, and one of the reasons for, like, for making Liquid Sky was that I wanted to make film which would be for, for, for film for film style, the same like uh, Andy Warhol was for, 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 for painting. I don't know if I managed to do it, but that was something which I really wanted wanted to do. So uh, you actually asked something else, right? Your question was... Uh, about the punk rock clubs in New York. Yes, 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 about, yes, yes. Well, well the first was the 
еще был дескриптор от М. Карлайл, who really was the person, she was the, this woman, this, 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 uh, this uh, punk model, new way model, and she really had half of her hair blue, half red. Uh, she looks like that, and, uh, and every, everything, you know, mm -hmm. because that's another, another artistic decision of mine was that I want to make film where everybody, which was absolutely fant fantasy film, not, not realistic, but all the characters will be maximum realistic, and people really would play themselves, they would use their real life, their serial characters for for the film and so 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 uh Anne and several other friends uh Anne really was like uh, very noticeable person in the bad club and all that. So we started going to clubs together as her. And then my 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 GP, uh Yuri Neyman and, and his wife Marina Levikova who became became a designer for the film. They joined us. Yuri really made the nightclub of New York thousands of Polaroids. They still exist. But sometimes we think it would be good to make an exposition about what this is Polaroid. So it's like a history of nightlife of New York at that point. So we really kind of made research. We really studied this life. It doesn't mean that we wanted to copy it because the first, it's not a realistic film, but obviously, obviously we tried in the beginning to, to, to take, to take a, a, as a costume designer a person who was making costumes for nightclubs. And it just didn't work because it's not the same. You know, for film, you, need, you, you cannot just lose what, what agrees to real life. It should work dramatically. It should have special style, a different thing. And then, which had very small budget. At first, I didn't want to have a designer at all. I thought that we'll manage without. But then I realized that I do need, and we had Marina who already participated in our research, so she was completely in the project. And she is a, prof she is a professional designer in many ways, but she, she, she was educated as a costume designer at her, at her first profession. So she was, uh, she was, yeah. so, so she knew it that, you know, we never had this idea to copy, to copy real club, club lifestyle. We wanted to create something specific for this film, which was more for this film. Mm -hmm. The, the movie seems to have a, a metaphor of, of drugs and unprotected sex. Is that uh, the intention? Yes, yes, yes. Well, like, you know, that, that was another... Why I made Liquid Sky? That's another idea. I already said about several of them. And the uh, main, main idea was to create plot which, which, which take together all the... All, all, all the myths, all, all, all the metaphors of the time, like uh, like the aliens from outer space, sex, rock and roll, everything, all the cultural models of the time should be put together in one plot, which which we did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it has uh, it has everything. Even the list of characters, we were uh, very. Uh, accurate about putting there not only nightclub people but all the representatives for all, all the other social groups mm -hmm. how many days did it take to film yeah how many days what shooting or what shooting yeah well shooting wasn't typical because when the, this question everybody was asking you need to put it to the term and the term budget film, we can speak about something like 20 days, probably, I don't know. But really, we had 50 days. And we had 50 days that was planned from the beginning because the schedule wasn't a normal schedule. Uh, first of all, the idea of making and Caroline playing two roles, you cannot shoot one more than one shot like that a day. Because only, only making, changing her makeup takes three hours. 
and uh, you cannot shoot more than one take because that was all time. Today it would be very easy in computer time, but back then it meant really uh, taking old camera very long because you cannot take film out of during the shooting out of there. And then put it again from the beginning. We're shooting one half of the frame and another half of the frame. Yeah. So it's a very very complete, technically complicated thing. It takes a lot of time. So uh, so all the split screen films that are playing two roles were taking the uh, shot a day. Another thing which which I had in mind because I needed to create very special look. I knew that we cannot shoot during the night outside of, we cannot shoot exteriors uh, during the night, real night. We needed to have a sky, sea sky, uh, and that's possible to do only during, only during so-called magic hour. In New York, this magic hour was several minutes. So to have enough shots like that in the film, in the script by script, they had about 50 shots. We could do it only one way, every day to shoot one shot because with you know, three minutes uh, it's difficult to shoot even three takes of one shot. But usually you, you can make only one take. But we managed to do more, with, again, with a very complicated organization for that. But it meant that we're shooting half of the day. And after that, we're moving to the other location just to shoot at this one shot of magic hour. And then we go back to other location. So, of course, you cannot shoot film in 20 days if you're shooting only half of the day and then you go to another location. But I knew that I have small budget, but completely different approach to small budget. So small budget was rich mostly by having very, very small crew, with everybody making several different roles and different breaks, uh, different different division of labor between members of the crew. I actually, I had no assistance at all uh, because, uh, because like all my production crew almost never been on a set because they they prepared another location that, that I didn't have other people to prepare location. And sitting, uh, sitting on the set, I actually couldn't get out, you know, I couldn't go out the toilet, for example. I needed to sit there because nobody but me was on the set of production crew. And many things like that, many things like that, it wasn't the usual. So if, if to take all, all, the, all, all the objects, which were normal objects, like restaurants or stuff, so that they were shot very, very fast. If we were shooting the entire film, like we were shooting this, this location, that would be less than 20 days. Mm -hmm. where, where did you find uh, Anne Carlyle? Well, I told you, we, uh, our casting director was Bob Brady, and she was, she, his casting was done together with his classes. He had a lot of students at School of Visual Art class, private students he lost. And uh, Anne was one of them. Oh, that's right. So, so we became friends during the casting. During this casting, we not only, you know, found a lot of, uh, a lot of actors uh, among the Bob students and Bob himself, but some of them really made actors, like this German, German guy. He... Uh, was an actor at all. He wanted to be an actor, and he was came during the casting of previous pre previous projects. And you know, the, the, the Bob had the entire floor of his loft covered with, with photographs of actors who were coming kind of for casting. And I came one day to his place, seen this amazing face on the floor, uh, started reading it, and he was writing. In his resume, he was writing what food he loved, what kind of girls he loved, nothing about acting because he never acted in his life. And I said, Bob, look, what a beautiful face. And he said, well, that he is not a professional, he cannot act. I said, well, he cannot act, so let's make him actor. So, so, guy was 
Hebe to become Bob's student. Actually, at the moment we started shooting, he already played in several, in several of his Broadway productions and made his own rock, rock group. Uh, how, how did the movie do in theaters? Boy, that, that was the most interesting because it was the most successful, commercially successful independent film. Not only then, I think, I think the record has never been beaten because in several cities in New York, in Boston, and Washington, D.C., it played almost four years nonstop in the same theater. More than three years. And uh, back then, you know, variety, everybody was writing about that because it's never happened before in history. It was very successful, both with audience and with critics, because our distributors even advertised, uh, advertised uh, Liquid Sky as the most, uh, the film most loved by critics. Uh, I think it's only in New York, in New York Times had three reviews. I, I, I don't know what other film had three reviews in New York Times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, to at least, at least make its money back? Well, that's more complicated because, uh, you know, the, making money back depends on many, that's completely different, uh, different, 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 different subject. But it, yes, it finally made money back, though a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of money were, you know, especially in a foreign distribution was, I think, At least it did well on video, and did uh, did the cable channels well, play it? It did well. It did well. It really brought money back. And uh, by estimation, it made fantastic amount of money. I mean, it, uh, some professional companies tried to estimate real, uh, real, and it was like more than this. Uh, so it was a lot of money. Good. That's good. Has anybody ever come to you wanting to do a remake or or a sequel? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, the remake the idea came. Uh, you know, for many years, uh, a lot of people, like producers, came to me with the idea of, of sequel, and I never knew how to do it because it looked like time changed completely. It's very difficult to follow. years ago, it really changed. Time started, all the style of ages, some new way, but started coming back. And then I had an idea for both, for sequel and for, and for, and for remake. Actually, remake, I was, uh, I don't know, I mean, I tried to find some interest, and I found some interest, not, but not to, to the level of financing, because I do think it should be a low budget film. If to make remake, it, it should really, it should, it should change the uh, the period. It should be exactly the same period, like in the original Liquid Sky. Just made that low budget way, made the all the modern computer computer technique, and that should be really a striking psychedelic film. That's my opinion. Almost, almost without change of the screen. Uh, I didn't find anyone who really, really loved the idea. Speaking about sequel, it's almost, script is almost this week. And, and Caroline and I were, uh, wrote the script with the idea when I came playing the same role about like Margaret coming back. And uh, I 
будто фінічний прайс на цей момент, де ми маємо Yeah, I mean, I personally think it's it's great as a standalone film, but that would be pretty cool to see uh, an updated version. Um, yeah. In 2000, you did Poor Liza. Uh, how was working with Lee Grant? Uh, very good. What a pleasure. Yeah, she's a great, she's a great actress. And uh, yes. Ben Gazira narrated. How did you get him for that? Oh, he uh, liked the script. It wasn't, wasn't a problem at all. The problem was during the shooting that he noted Lee Grant. Lee Grant was... She's an uh, no, absolute professional without any. Uh, uh, ben Kazara, uh, you know, his role is a uh, long monologue. He's like a, like a narrator of the story, uh, but he had no idea at all uh, that, uh, about learning the script, learning the lines. He was sure that it would be like teleprompter there. But, you know, in Russia, you cannot find Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is also so, 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 So how are you uh, handling the pandemic? Slava, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I hope, uh, yeah, you do get the um, the new Liquid Sky made. Um, but uh, until then, stay safe because we need you, and have yourself a great rest of your day. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, Slava Sukerman. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a nice man, full of wisdom and great stories. I enjoyed talking to him. Um, until next time, God, I'm still trying to get used to not doing the social media part. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes. 
Watch Liquid Sky. You won't regret it.